joined us, here's a little bit about what's coming up in the life of Public Church. If you are new to the life of our church and you really want to get connected in, why don't you go and hit the description box right now and there is a link that will say new to church, so just click on that. If you are believing for something, if there's an area of your life that you need prayer for, why don't you click the description box as well because there is a whole pastoral care team who would love to pray with you right now. So you can click the link, submit your prayer request and we will definitely be praying for you. Public Church, thank you so much for your constant and consistent generosity. There is a new way to give in the life of our church, so check this video out right now. If you were here last week, you would have noticed Pastor Shane um, spoke a, a fantastic message around the thou shall not, and then previous to that, Pastor Kim spoke around the case of the Ten Commandments. And the thou shall not series has actually spooked some interesting conversation. Uh, I had somebody who spoke to me about thou shall not, and, and they were saying, you know, that we don't even hear not in our English vocabulary. And I was like, well, I've definitely heard not before. Uh, my mum says no and not a lot. Uh, but thou shall not is, is funny because a lot of the times probably, whether we like to admit it or not, we probably see God like this. Like, you shall not, thou shall not, you shouldn't do this. And, and, and the reason why it's fruit such interesting conversation is because even though we may see God like this, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is like this. In fact, last week we found out that this was actually a marriage proposal. I said to Shane, thank you so much for clarifying what the Ten Commandments actually means. Um, because I've had it wrong for a long time. <laughs> and I know God sees my heart, uh, but <laughs> I've had it wrong this whole time. Thou shalt not was, was not necessarily an imposed law on us to be able to do. What it actually was, was an opportunity for God to affirm his already existing love with you and I. And I love the fact that even throughout all of the Old Testament, I, I, I'm reading some of the scriptures and I'm starting to see, because every time we read the Old Testament or any scriptures, it always points to Jesus. And I'm starting to see that God's love for us really is everlasting. Like as in like, it has always been there. It didn't just happen in John 3.16 where the Bible clearly says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It actually says in Exodus that God heard the cries and the affliction of his people. Aren't you so thankful that God has heard your cry of affliction and that God has come and delivered you from whatever you might be going through? This is the God that we serve, that he is motivated to move towards us, not because we're great, not because we're good, but because he loves us. And you see, it's, it's, yes, we know this, but let this resonate in our heart as truth today. Because I want to encourage you as we go along this series of understanding God and this, uh, I guess, not these rules or, or anything like that, but we start understanding who God is and what this actually means towards us, we can apply this into our life. And now, listen to this, our life can be a response to what God has established in His Word. Let's have a look at um, Exodus 20, 2 to 4. It says, I'm the Lord your God. I'm going to deal with two of the commands. And um, the, it really is sort of one but two. So it's sort of like 1A or it's sort of like 2A, 2B. But I'm, I'm going to do my best to try and go through both of them because we're going to go through all of these. Next week we've got Pastor Renee and we're going to go through every single one of these. So it says this in Exodus 20, 2 to 4. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. I'm going to deal with that one today. And you shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. In other words, don't carve anything, don't make things and, and worship them. I am the Lord your God. It's almost like he's already made his case. Remember me? I'm the guy that got you out of the land of slavery. I am the person who's delivered you. I am the Lord your God. In Matthew 22, 35 to 38, it says, one of them, an, an ex expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. They're talking about Jesus right now. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Let's have a look at Exodus 3, 7 to 8. It says, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I heard their cry. 
I remember when I was 18 years old, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, who were great pastors, they've been doing ministry for 30 years, um, they, they've been faithful in their local church setting, and they've had crusades on their heart for a long time. They did crusades in PNG of like over 20,000 people. And then there was one day where they felt to do a crusade in Elizabeth in Adelaide. Um, and, and I'll never forget that the basis of her and him wanting to do this crusade or wanting to do this outreach in Elizabeth Adelaide was this, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I heard their cry. This was the motivation for God to deliver us out of slavery. This was the motivation for us to go and do an outreach in a place over in Adelaide. This is the motivation for God full stop, that he hears the cry of his people. He hears where you and I are at right now. God's motivation for deliverance is always that he saw the affliction and heard the cry. He saw the affliction and heard the cry. So a little bit of an overview just before we get into the specifics. The no other God commandment overview and this sort of what we're talking about and touching today is God says when he establishes the Ten Commandments, he's basically going to teach these people how to be human. There's dysfunction and deep brokenness of being 480 years a slave, right? And it's gone through generations and generations. So immediately they're teaching them how to be human. God also wants to deal with the slave mentality. I think this is on my screens too, by the way. God wants to deal with the slave mentality. God wants to transition them from human doings into human beings. This is important. God is establishing a community bringing forth the Messiah, who is Jesus, and he is also establishing his kind of life, God's kind of life, in a group of people so that the world will know who he is. You've got to think to yourself, it's 480 years since God spoke, and the first thing that God says to Moses is, I want you to eat, kill a lamb, make food. How many of you like lamb roasts? Hello. I'm not really a massive fan of lamb. I'll eat it, But I'm not a massive fan. It's very gamey. All right, move on. Unpopular. You'll know what I'm talking about. It's a gamey taste. (laughs) Georgia agrees. Kat agrees. There's some Christians here. Praise the Lord. (laughs) And so, so here we have, here we have God saying, I want you to kill a lamb, eat it. And then what I want you to do is I want you to get some of the blood, paint it on your doors, and as I pass over, now I know that these are the houses that I will spare, right? What God is essentially doing from the outset is asking this question. As absurd as this is, do you trust me? When God establishes the commandments and the first thing he says is have no other gods besides me, The same question he is posing to the Israelites is, do you trust me? The same question that God is asking us today in 2021, right here on a Sunday morning, is do you trust me? It's all about trust. This is what every, everything is revolved and centered around that question. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? And the question of today, right now, is do you trust me? I I don't trust lots of people, but I do trust the optometrist. The optometrist, I do trust. Um, I have a funny, I I don't know why I like the optometrist. It's like a love-hate relationship with the optometrist. And that's probably why, I. I, you're meant to go every two years, but I go like every four. (laughs) And I I remember I was like, okay, I've got to get some new glasses. Like, I literally, the frames were so bad, I couldn't even, like, the, the lenses, I couldn't even see, like, on the road. It was terrible. And so I went to the optometrist, and, and I, uh, you put your neck there, and you're like, yep, ready to go. And there's a chart. Let's, let, let's put the chart up. There should be a chart on my, on my, yeah, there we go, right? So they do this chart thing, right? And it's funny because, like, when I first start this chart, I'm, I'm very confident. And I say it with some gut, so. Like, when they say, what's the first letter? I'm like, E! <laughs> I don't really, but I'm confident, like, I'm very confident. They say, what's the next one? I'm saying F, P. And as they keep going on, I'm very confident. And they start, like, fl- they start doing things. They start flicking things around. And I feel like what it's meant to do, is, it, well, it's not meant to put you on edge, but it puts you on edge. You, you, you're saying, yeah, that's definitely P. And they're like, okay. Flick, 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 flick. And you're like, was that, I'm sure it was a P. <laughs> 100% convinced that's a P. Flick, 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 flick. You move down, they T, O, Z, right? 
But by the time I get to like this, this, this in here, I, I start to sweat a bit. You would understand that I grew up in a paranoid household, right? Where everybody was out to get me. Don't trust anybody who offers you lollies, like that whole deal, right? And so like, oh, don't drink out of your, out of your friend's bottles. You're going to get minge in a cockle, like that whole vibe. Right, that was my environment in my household. And so I remember mum used to every now and then go, show me your eyes. And I'd be like, <laughs> she's Canadian. And I'd show her my eyes and she'd say, gosh. And I'm like, what? What's wrong with them? She's like, there's a brown spot. It's my pupil, mum. She's like, no, I think it could be a cataract. How extreme is this? Like, what are you saying? I've got cancer in my eye. Like, what are you saying? I'm 12 years old. I haven't even been exposed to sun much. But So I'm starting to hear mum's voice like here where I can't make out the letters. And I'm like, maybe I do have a cataract in my eye. Like, so I start sweating and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to the, to the last. But, but what I noticed in the eye test is that at the very front and at the top, I'm very confident. But as I start to move down the chart, I start to lose my confidence because I still, I feel like, and, and this is pretty, pretty easy to understand, but I feel like I start to lose trust in what I can't see clearly. Like what I can't see clearly, I don't have the same confidence that I had when I did. What I don't see clearly, I start to lose trust in, and I feel like this is probably a little bit like our faith. Where, if we, where, we, where we might not be able to see something super clear, and then now the question that God posed at Sinai, the same question that he's posing to us today, do you trust me? Well, I'm not sure. Because I can't really see clearly. I can't really see the outcome, so I don't really know how to trust the process. Maybe it's I can't fully see my promise, right? I can't fully see my promise come to pass, so I might just trust in my ability to open the doors. How many of you know what this is like? Or, or, or maybe it's, I can't fully see my future, so I might just settle for my present. I don't know about you, but this is the faith journey. The same question when God poses, have no other gods or don't make idols, is do you trust me? And I feel like sometimes our lack of trust is usually linked to the fact that we might not be able to see the outcome or the future as clear as God can. But how many of you know that God sees things from the beginning to the end? How many of you know that actually the scriptures say in Hebrews, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. In fact, faith is for the conviction of things that are not seen. And a lot of the times we think that our faith is linked to what we know. Faith is linked to what we cannot see. And so I'm not moved, I'm not shaked, I, 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 I'm not moved by the fact that maybe things aren't lining up right in my life right now. I'm holding on to faith because the question that God posed at Sinai is the same question that God is posing to you today is, do you trust me? Do you trust me? I have no other gods. Do you trust me? Don't make idols. Do you trust me? The problem is, is that we live in a culture where these three things are major. Listen to me really quickly. Immediate, visible, and seen results are like paramount in our culture. Immediate seen results. Ah, it's like lions and tigers and bears. You know what I mean? Like immediate seen results now. And so a lot of the times we, 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 we're trying to see what God is doing now. Hear me. We're trying to see what God is doing now in the context of what God did five to 10 years ago. What if God's doing something new in your life today? But because we're trying to see it, remember it's see, see, everything see, we're trying to see. Maybe because we're trying to see it in the context of a decade ago, we're missing that God is wanting to do something new. Do you know all the conversations that I have with people, and I've been pastoring now for a little bit, young people for a bit, I've realized that a lot of the times I can see that God is doing something new. But when Isaiah the prophet says, behold, I'm doing something new, do you perceive it? A lot of people don't perceive the new because they're thinking about what God did 10 years ago, what God did five years ago. And I'm trying to see what God is doing, but I can't perceive it. But God, what if God is wanting to do something new today? And what if the reason that we can't see it is because we're trying to see it in the context of five years ago? 
Ah, uh, here's one. If you're constantly talking about what God did then and not about what God is doing now, we've probably failed the eye test. The real eye test. God is wanting to do something new today. I'm thinking about youth ministry. Thinking about Sai and Shani and Aaron, all of our youth leaders. How unbelievable it is what they're doing and how they're, how they're moving things forward. I remember when I was a youth pastor, which wasn't too long ago, but when I first started, youth ministry and the landscape of youth ministry has changed so much. And I remember when I was doing youth a decade ago, starting from five, ended up getting to 300. Not a day's pay on staff. Like this was just what was on my heart. This is what we felt like God to do. And, and pioneering this youth ministry, I'm seeing, right, what we're doing now and it is a miracle to be able to see God shape and move young people in a totally new way than what he did 10 years ago. I used to be able to say, hey, now, now I'm not going to diminish, like it was hard work. For a year we had like 10 kids. <laughs> it's like, God, I don't know if you still want me to keep doing this. But I remember we used to be like, we're giving away a pair of shoes. And it was like, well, we could at least guarantee 20, 30 kids are going to come for this. Amazing. Then we snag them and we preach the gospel. They get saved. Amazing. They roll into a connect group. Fantastic. Today, you try and say, hey, we've got a great event on. Hey, we've got some great shoes that we give away. Can I just tell you, it's not enough. Young people today don't really need the catch 22. They need to feel connected relationally. Things have changed. Things have changed. God is doing something new today. And we have to find out what that is. We're trying to see what God is doing now in the context of what God did for them. Who was them? My friend, my neighbor. We're trying to see what God is doing in our life. Remember I test. We're trying to see, 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 see results and all these things. We're trying to see what God is doing now in my life through the lens of what God is doing in them, my friends. Babe, hey, maybe if we like do exactly what they did, then we're going to see the exact same results and we're going to be fine. The Bible says... In Psalm 37, verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Commit your way. <laughs> not his way, not her way, your way. <laughs> commit your way to the Lord, and listen to this, trust in him and he will act. Don't commit your way through the lens of somebody else's way. <laughs> I'm committing my way to the Lord and he will act. We're trying to see what God is doing in the context of what I want for now. And we've already talked about one of the most fantastic prayers that Jesus ever prayed was, nevertheless, God, let your will be done in my life. The eye test, we're trying to see, 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 when God is saying, instead of trying to see, will you trust? Instead of trying to see, will you trust? And, and can I tell you something? Like, listen to me. And the reason why we have, don't have any other gods before me and now don't make carved images, is because we had a culture of people who were conditioned to want to see things. You, got, you get what I'm saying? So they're carving things to see things. Like I need to see. In fact, when this was getting written, and when God was speaking to Moses, the Israelites were trying to carve a golden calf so they could see the God who they were worshiping. And so everything is about seeing, but we know that faith is not seeing we know that there is more to, to life than just seeing, comparing, and trying to figure out what God is trying to do in our life. No, no, no. This is about trust. This has always been and always will be about trust. And we've got to be careful because if we don't understand that this is about trust, we have our eyes fixed on the fruit of God or what God can do for me. And that's not what this relationship is all about. Hey, let's have a look at some of the gods that were here. Because when they say no other gods, there's a reason why. Um, look at this guy. My goodness. <laughs> I promise you, I feel like my grandma had this in her house. And my grandma, <laughs> my grandma was a professor at a university, and she majored in like world religions and different things, philosophy and all this sort of stuff. And you would go into a place, and I promise you, there were like Buddhas, Baals, everything everywhere. Haunted House 3, like, I'm telling you. It was so, you remember it, Renee? It was so scary. But this is one of the gods. So, so this, when, when, when God is speaking to Moses and establishing this new trust relationship, when he says no other gods, these are what were out there in the world. Baal was just another word for Lord or Master. When the Israelites invaded Canaan under Joshua, the Canaanites worshipped local gods known as Baals or Baalim. Let's go to the next god. This is scary. 
Ashtoreth. Even the name gives me shivers. This is a legit calf god. Like, they literally found this. And um, they did, like, Ashtoreth. Let's look at Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth was the consort of Baal. It, this was a Canaanite fertility goddess who had attracted the worship of some of the Israelites ever since the invasion of Canaan. The worship of Ashtoreth was widespread during the time of the judges and throughout the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah, as well as male and female ritual prostitution. The cult of Ashtoreth also involved child sacrifice. Insane. Let's go to the next god. That is scary. Kamosh looks like Gandalf. Kamosh. Kamosh was the national deity of the Moabites whose name mostly meant destroyer or fish god, right? While he was most readily associated with the Moabites, uh, where are we? Moabites, according to the judges, he seemed to have been the national deity of the Ammonites as well. These were the gods that God was dealing with when he said, hey, let's not make any other gods. And in fact, let's not take it a step further and carve them out. Let's not do those two things, right? Because we're establishing a trust relationship together. Let's have a look at some context here and why this was an issue. The Israelites' history demonstrated their tendency to false worship. The Israelites were in slavery and they were under the Egyptians and they knew and they were aware that there were many gods that were going on. And so they had a tendency towards false worship. The Bible says in Genesis 31 verse 19, it won't be on the screen, Laban had gone to shear his sheep and Rachel stole her father's household gods. This is before Sinai. Gods existed. Another reason why this was an issue is to have other gods is obviously to replace God, right? So this was supposed to be an exclusive relationship between the Israelites and God. And so now that I'm making these gods and now that I'm putting these gods up there, right, I'm literally saying now my worship is split. I worship you, but I also worship what I can see, and this is the problem with the eye test, is that oftentimes we won't worship God because he's, we understand it's in spirit and in truth, but we want to see. And so they would make images. The other one is having other gods is evidence of one's lack of faith in God. This is why it's an issue. And the question that we have to pose and ask ourselves today is this. I love, I love what this quote says in Herbert Schlossberg. What a great name. It says, but anyone with a hierarchy of values has placed something at its apex. And whatever that is, is the God that he serves. Anyone with a hierarchy of values has placed something at the top. And whatever that is, is the God he serves. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, where do I get my security? Where do I get my salvation? Where do I feel most at peace? Where do I feel most when I'm in my grace zone? And if the answer comes anywhere else than other than God, then we have to ask ourselves the question, has my trust in God maybe left and have I put my trust and faith in something that is seen? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves all of the time. And I've noticed that isn't it interesting that what can initially just grab my attention can also be the affection of my worship. Something that just innocently can grab my attention can also be the affection of my worship. We have to be so careful to guard our hearts at all times to make sure that he alone is who I trust in. The same question that God asked at Sinai is the same question that God is asking you today. Who do you trust? What do you trust in? Do you trust in your career? Do you trust in your income? Do you trust in your degree? Do you trust in your abilities? Do you trust in your excellence? Do you trust in your resume? Do you trust in yourself? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, then maybe we have to have a real serious look at where is God in my hierarchy of values? Is he number one? Is he first? Do I trust God in my giving? Do I trust God in loving people? These are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. I'm going to get the keys up. And obviously, it's not just around the God, we know that now it's around idols and images. And so what used to happen is these people would make these gods up and they would also carve out gods so they could see it. We saw some of the scary ones up there. Um, and so this idea of these idols and images, one was getting made while the Ten Commandments were getting spoken. And, and, and I guess, and I was thinking about this, and, and I guess the thing that we have to understand is although we might not be carving anything out, 
Because if anybody carved anything out and put it somewhere and was like, this is the God in whom I serve, you would be like, there is something wrong with you. <laughs> like, you were weird. <laughs> what are you doing? So although we might not necessarily have the tendency to carve something out and put it on a shelf and be like, that is God. I think this idea of condensing God or minimizing God into a formula is what we have to be careful not to try and do. To take the supernatural, incredible awe of God and try and condense Him down into A, B, C. He breaks every box you ever try and put Him in. Every formula you try and put Him in, He breaks it. So although we might not make idols, I think that many of us might be guilty in condensing God or minimizing God into a formula. Maybe the formula that you've posed hasn't worked. The same question, though, is posed. Do you trust me? This is all about trust. It's actually not about anything else. Have no other gods. Don't make any idols. Don't condense me. Don't minimize me. What God is really asking is, do I have your full trust? I can come to church and I can worship and I can leave here still with the ache in my heart that I don't know if I fully trust God 100%. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 21, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. I'm going to get some of the guys to come up um, that we're going to do something in a second. Um, dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Going to the optometrist and getting my adjustments, obviously I realized that, you know, they take a couple of lenses out, they substitute it. Now I can see clearly. So what was once blurry, I could be like, yes, yes, yes. But when we're talking about the eye test, I don't necessarily think we're just talking about something that we're conditioned to see. But there's another set of eyes in the spirit realm that I feel like God is wanting our eyes to open up. And that is the eyes of our heart. That God would open up the eyes of our heart so that we can fully see and know who He is. Not the eyes of our, not so I can see what God is doing here, not so that I can predict what God will do here, not that I can condense and minimize what God is doing here. The same question that God asks is, do you trust me? It actually requires us to have eyes of faith, not the eyes that we can naturally see. And so this eye test of the optometrist, yes, it helped me naturally see, but the Spirit of God is what opens up our eyes or opens up the eyes of our heart to truly see who God is. I remember uh, when I was a young kid, I was well and truly on my faith journey. I remember I uh, went to my friend's house and their parents were radical Christians. And they used to sing this song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Open the Eyes of My Heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. How many of you remember that song? Some of us remember it. Open the eyes of my heart, open the eyes of my heart. I remember every time I heard that song, I used to like get so emotional. I used to legitimately cry. Um, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know that you were supposed to cry or didn't know that there was a presence of God or there was a higher power that was, but every time I heard the song and, and I remembered when, when I would hear it, it, it was like, oh my gosh, like, yes, I know that God is real. The Bible says that he puts eternity in our hearts. He puts eternity in our hearts, this question mark that only God can answer. And I'll never forget at that point in time, in that moment, my heart started to open to the reality of God. Listen to Deuteronomy 4 verse 12. It says, Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but you saw no form. There was only a voice. They didn't see who God was. They only heard a voice. But how many of you know how lucky it is today that we see who God is <laughs> in the person of Jesus? We see who God is in the Holy Spirit erupting in our hearts. We see who God is when He moves through my friend. We see who God is when we get together and we worship and we can feel His presence. We actually see who God is. And maybe some of us have been conditioned to see the outcome of God rather than to see God in the fullness of who He really is, not just what He can do for you. Will you trust Him? Will you trust Him? Have no other gods before me. Don't condense me or minimize me. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Philippians 2, 6 to 8. I'm just going to close on this. It says this. Who, though was in the form of God, did not account 
equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in a human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. I'd love you just to close your eyes and bow your heads just as we reflect this morning. Now, my life is a response. Now, right now is a response. Maybe I've been trying to see God wrong the whole time. And the trust question is the same question that God asked at Sinai. The same question that God is asking then is God is asking right now. Do you trust me? Maybe some of us have been conditioned way too much to try and see. But maybe God wants to open the eyes of our heart. Maybe God wants us to see him in a different way. I'd love it if everybody could just stand just just right across this moment, but I'd love you just to keep your eyes closed, head bowed. I really feel like God is going to do some ministry right now. I'd love to pray for you really quickly. We're going to sing this song and then we're going to see what God wants to do. Let's pray really quickly. God, I thank you for every person in this room. God, I pray that you would erupt inside of us, God, our heart. God, I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart that we will see you. Not what you can do for me, but God, that we will see you. Because God, we know that when we see you in your fullness, God, everything changes. The things of this world grow strangely dim. spoke to you and you want to respond or you want to give your life to Jesus for the very first time, why don't you click the description box? There is a link that says new to faith and we will have a pastor reach out to you this week. Thank you so much for joining us today. We cannot wait to see you next Sunday. We hope you have a fantastic week. Bye.